Psalm 127 verses 1 and 2 read, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. And everybody said amen. amen. I want to just talk to you a little bit from, let's take the first three words, if we will, of this chapter and make that our title tonight. Except the Lord. Except the Lord. We, we uh, are first introduced here to this concept of building, of bringing together building, establishing, creating something. I, uh, I know there's men and women in here that have built things before, put things together. And uh, whether it's a physical structure in a building like we're in, the, some of the, the, the good people of CTK remember a few years ago when you would spend your nights here building and doing different things. I see Brother Buddy is here tonight, a builder, and other people that were here would labor, putting things together. You, you may have a, a knowledge, understanding of how to build things. Maybe it's not a structure. Maybe it's more... Uh, an, an engineering, a device, a tool. Maybe you're, you're good with uh, uh, mechanics and things. Maybe, uh, my goodness, my, my mother, when I was a child, would, uh, uh, she, she was a, a, a mom of many talents, and one of the things that she did was she uh, baked cakes and would do uh, wedding cakes and other things like that. Um, I, I don't know how she got into that, but as a child, I didn't care. I was just glad that she baked cakes. <laughs> and she would do the layer cakes and, and, and the, the tiers and the towers. And I remember her doing all the different pieces, all the different sections, and then taking them. And you know how they used to do, they would take the cakes and they'd stack them. I, we don't do that anymore and as much. You don't see it, I guess, as much anymore. And to get those cakes, cakes perfect on the top she had to shave off the top of the cake and uh, shave around the corner and then she made her own icing and she would put that icing in that in that bag and she had all the little uh, different uh, I don't even know what you call them the tips and she would do all the I don't I don't know tooling or fl floral decorations or whatever kind of thing on there I guess you weren't tooling the cake but that's in you know in my <laughs> masculine mind. Um, she would do all this stuff on there. And then me and Sarah got the leftovers. We got all the scraps, all the cutoffs, all the extras there. So when you'd shave that cake, cake on the top, you'd get just that top layer of the cake. So we, you know, the cake would be about this thick, and then I'd take a full slather of icing right on top of that. And I, I learned that the best part of the cake is actually that part that's been shaved off. That's where all the moisture is. It's on the edging of the cake. And that's what she was cutting off. Praise God. And uh, Brother Jeff, I feel a witness in the spirit here tonight. Amen. And she would build that cake. She would build that cake and put that together. So maybe, maybe that's something that you've done or whatever it is that you create, whatever it is that you've built. One thing that you know in building is that it is pretty easy to tear things down. In fact, it doesn't take very much to tear things down. Anyone can destroy something and tear something down, but to build something, it takes time and effort, intentionality, it takes support, it takes work, and you've got to put that together. So there is in it... There is an artistry. There is a patience that is required. There's a thought process that's required. And we understand that in building, it takes effort. It takes labor. 
It takes work. In fact, it speaks to this when it says, they labor in vain that build it, except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain. Well, why? Because you cannot build something without there being labor, without there being some, as we would say, sweat equity that has to be invested, has to be involved. But except the Lord build the house, except the Lord build the house. This verse here is warning against something and at the same time it is testifying so much towards something. I want to, before we go there though, to think about this. It is possible, and he lets us know this, it is possible for us to be a part of building without the Lord. Because this is the contest, if you will. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. That it is possible for us to step up to the blueprint, so to speak, and take tool in hand and, 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 and assemble material and attempt to build something without, without God actually being involved. Human labor without God, first of all, we must understand, is completely possible. This is the testimony of the Tower of Babel. When Noah survives the, 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 the great flood, there afterwards, he says, be fruitful and multiply and spread across the earth. And humanity in its fear or in its arrogance did exactly the opposite. They congregated together. They resisted the, the command of God to be fruitful, multiply, and to, to go inherit and spread. But they, they gathered together, of course, steeped in their sin. And then they, they ventured and said, let us build a, a tower which reacheth up, reaches up into heaven. And, and perhaps I know some people think, well, well, how crazy is it to think they were built trying to build a tower into outer space? I, I don't believe that they were trying to build a tower into outer space. They were trying to build a high rise, a high point. They were trying in their own man-made way to build a, a monument of structure in that place. Perhaps it was even because Fresh in their memory, the judgment of the Lord was manifest through the flooding of the earth. And perhaps they thought, well, if we can build a structure that rises above the flood, then, then we don't have to be afraid of the Lord. And they set their heart to build it. And the Bible says that God looked down and he saw that nothing would be withheld from them when they came together in that unity, when they came together in that focus. God testified of the power of human ingenuity when they unify in purpose. This is pretty phenomenal. It's pretty amazing to think about. But, but why wouldn't it? Because God made us in His image. He, he, when He says that, is not deifying humanity, but He is... In essence, he's really saying, oh yeah, I did really build them with the capacity to do pretty amazing things. And because they set their mind to do it without the Lord, God said, I will confound their language. I will break their communication. I will thwart their plan. And so the Tower of Babel, as we know in history, God comes down, he confounds the language, and, and that frustration alone would what what scripture would record would be the very thing that would finally drive humanity into different regions of the world, ultimately obeying the thing that God had said and commanded. But we can look at that and recognize that it is possible. Everybody say possible. It is possible that we can labor without the Lord. And if they can do that in the Tower of Babel, how much more can we do that in our life? 
We can do that in our life. The structure is not, is not proof that God is working. Because we can build the structure and step back and say, oh, look, look at this. God is blessing this. And, and maybe he is, but maybe he, he isn't. Human labor without God is, pros, is possible first. But secondly, human labor without God is definitely going to be fruitless. Human labor without God does not secure God's wisdom. And ultimately, it does not secure God's protection. Now, I know we're talking about building the house. We're talking about building the house. But, but, but let's take this in terms beyond just a physical structure of building. Let's take this to, to us as individuals. Amen? Because when we are redeemed, are we not? Did he say what? Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So, so in spiritual terms, when we are born again, we become the house of the Lord. We become the sanctuary, the place of God. If we're not careful in our life, we can, we can put effort into building the house of the Lord. And we can look around, look, look at what I've done. Look, look, God surely must be pleased with all of this. And yet, human labor without God is fruitless. It does not secure God's wisdom. And it ultimately does not secure God's protection. So the question tonight, we must ask, am I building my house with the Lord? This is everything. My life, my soul, my being, the essence of who I am. Make, make a further extension. Take, take it to the relationships that you have. My family, my, my marriage, start there. Is, is, is my marriage a work of the Lord? Is God involved in this? Or is this something that I'm doing? Is, is my home life, is this something that God is involved with in, in our relationships with the Lord? Do I have the wisdom of God at work in my life? And then also, do I have the protection of the Lord at work in my life. Last night I, I, I came home, I, a couple pastors called me, and so I had to run over to St. Louis, and I dropped one of them off over there at the airport, and I got home about 9.30, 9.40. We were talking on the phone most of the drive home, and as I got home in the busyness of everything, I walked into the house, and I, I knew I had to take out the, 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 the garbage for this morning's pickup, and so I, I took it out, and I walked back into the garage, walked back into the house, and I'm on the phone, and I'm, I'm talking, and I'm looking for extra trash, and there wasn't any, and I was planning on going back out there, and I got so tired, I hung up the phone and went to bed and fell asleep and got up this morning to take Luca to school and went out, and the back door was unlocked and not totally latched. And I stepped outside, and the garage door is wide open. <laughs> and we live on the corner where everybody goes. And I, I thought, oh, well, Janelle must have taken out an extra bag of trash and out there and everything. And, and so I said, babe, you, you took out the trash this morning? Or I took it out last night. No. I said, you haven't been outside yet. No. So all night long, our garage door is open our, our other garage door isn't even latched, and it's not even, it was, you know, it was on the door jam, but it wasn't all the way even closed, and I thought, oh no, and so I went running around looking for the things, what do they steal, what do they take, and there's my brand new lawnmower sitting at the end of the driveway, so all night people could see the big words on it, Honda, right there, and it's still there, and I was like, yes, it's still there. Thank you, Lord. And then I looked up, and I can't figure this out, but there were three boxes, big, one of them big cardboard box. It, had a, it was an old, old saw box that's fallen over. And I was like, okay, who, how did they get in here to knock that over? It must have been the wind. It must have been the wind. And so I walked around, and then I realized that something big enough to knock my wife's mirror on the side of the garage where the boxes were was over there too. So I don't know. And Janelle said, well, probably it's an animal. I was like, babe, 
it had to be a deer to push the mirror in on the side of your... So apparently there was a deer in our garage last night. I don't know, whatever it was. What am I saying? I'm saying we need God's protection when we don't even know. We need God's protection. So we better be building our house with the Lord. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build this. So verse 1 warns against, what does it warn against? It warns against overconfidence. Prosperity and security are not ultimately your accomplishments and my accomplishments but they are God's gifts. Prosperity and security are not ultimately your accomplishments, but God's gifts. Except the Lord build the house. Now, isn't it great when you're working a job and somebody else comes along that knows exactly what they're doing? And, and, and you can just stand there next to them and you see what they're doing. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. So then you do exactly what they're doing because they know what they're doing. And then you do exactly what they're doing or they're telling you something and you do, do that. You, you're, you're doing whatever. But then you step back and say, yeah, look at what I did. But reality is when that person goes to lunch or they drive off the job or whatever, you're sitting there and you're like, how, how do they do that? How, how, where do I go? You know, how do I figure all this stuff out? And thank God now for YouTube, right? Because you're pulling up YouTube and you're trying to figure out how to do this kind of thing. The reality is that the successes and the prosperities, the securities that we enjoy in our life spiritually, the blessings of the Lord are because of the Lord at work in our life. It's because he's there. We don't step back and say, yeah, yeah, you know, somebody's, man, you, you've been, you know, People that have been married many years, wow, you've got such a great marriage. How'd you do? Oh, yeah, we, we're, yeah, we got it. No sweat. No problem. No. If you're going to be honest, there were so many times. I was, I was just having this conversation the other day with somebody, and, and, and we, were talking, we were just talking about this, and they were like, you know, there really were, there really were a lot of years where we didn't think we were going to make it. <laughs> and and now we look back and we're, we're, we're actually, we would not have been surprised if we didn't make it. They were talking about the dysfunctions of, their, of their, both of their, uh, their homes, of uh, both spouse, the husband and the wife, both of their homes, their parents, dysfunction and, and, and marriages, whatever, and saying that, you know, there was really a time where we would not have been surprised if we wouldn't have made it because they're just, we didn't have the infrastructure, whatever, it wasn't there. But the Lord, except the Lord, build the house. And now you sit back and look and say, well, okay, look at this. God came along. God blessed. God helped. God did this. So verse 1 warns us, yes, it's going to take labor and it's going to take work. But it warns us against self-confidence. So here we are. Except the Lord build the house in your life. Whatever it is in your life, your life, your ministry, your marriage, your relationships. Whatever it is, whatever the endeavor is, whatever the corporate endeavor is. In fact, even, I, I could break it down in this, in this sense. Even in our corporate efforts, I was on the phone with Pastor Carraway just a, a little while before service and talking about um, Project Fiji and, and, and raising the money and, and how all this thing is going to work out and everything. But even in our endeavor and in our efforts, don't begin to think we can start to do things without the leading and the moving and the instructions and the blessings of the Lord in our life, just because it's sort of automatic. Well, this is what we do. And we can get ourselves in a mess, except the Lord built the house. Here's what he said. Uh, uh, in, uh, I, I think that's good for us to know. In Proverbs 16 and 18, he said, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We've got to beware of pride. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Don't, husband, don't say, look, look at this, look at this. I'm, I'm a great husband. Preacher, don't say, look at this, say, I'm a great preacher. Pastor, don't say, look at that, I'm a great pastor. No, except the Lord build the house. 
They labor in vain that build it. Prosperity and security are ultimately not our accomplishments. They are the Lord's. You say, well, well, you mean we don't have anything to do with it? I'm going to tell you how the Bible reveals. This is one of the wonderful things about Scripture is it tells us it doesn't just leave us to guess and to hope without knowing what we have to look forward to. It tells us where we're going. It tells us where we're heading. And one thing it tells us is that when we finally make it over, when this corruptible puts on incorruption and this mortal puts on immortality, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we shall be like him. So whenever that state happens and, and we leave this place and we are with him forevermore, one of the first things that's going to happen as he has gifted to us the Bible says crowns. He's going to crown us, amen, with glory. Hey, come on. You've overcome. Here it is. He's going to give us, uh, 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 if, if you're in Bible quizzing, whatever, you, you, get a, you get a ribbon, you get an award, whatever. When you win, you win this life. Overcome sin. God's going to give you a crown. But what does the Bible say we're going to do? We're going to take that crown and we're going to cast them at his feet. Why? Because whatever happens, I don't know the full state that will be there, but when we get there mentally, we're going to have clarity and we're going to say, no, Lord, power belongs to you. Glory belongs to you. Yes, we were there. We're so glad that we were able to be an apprentice a little bit along in the ministry, but except the Lord build the house. We didn't do it. It was you. It was your grace. It was your mercy. It was your love that was driving us, that was keeping us every single day. Except the Lord built the house. So beware of pride. Beware of self-exaltation. Beware of pride and self-exaltation in anything. When God blesses you, beware of pride. Beware of self-exaltation. When the goodness of God comes upon your life, beware of pride and self-exaltation. When you are in a season of plenty, while others around you are in a season of famine, be careful. Because it's easy when you're sitting in the blessed seat to be critical of those that aren't blessed. But how many have ever been in a place where less than blessing? And you're there. And sometimes in the seasons, in ministry and life, blessings come and go. And those blessings come and go and those struggles come and go. And those, those blessings and those struggles are not tied to your faithfulness or your consecration. Yeah, yeah. Right. Why? Because the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Yeah. And so some things are just life. And you're just, you're just living life. And it's because we're in this process of life and we're not yet redeemed. So beware of pride and beware of self-exaltation. And the reason why is because pride, it says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But pride ultimately leads us against God. It leads us against the ways of God. Because if we begin thinking that look at what I've done, look at what I've done, then all of a sudden, we, we can start justifying and doing our own thing. It's true, it's true of every one of us. It's true of us in our human capacities, in life, in successes, in anything. You think, oh man, I can do this. You know, you go and you, you, uh, you're, you're, you're in school and you're uh, whatever. I don't know. I'm just trying to come up with the analogy. You're in recess and you're playing and... and all of a sudden, a growth spurt hits you, and you're taller than every other kid in class, and so everybody's picking you for the team. Everybody's picking you. Why? Because you're a head taller than them. You know, if it's in basketball, you're, you're taller. You're going to be better. You know, when you're in, you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, you think you're great. You know, whatever. You know, you're just taller than them. But then you go to camp, and all of a sudden, you realize you aren't athletic at all. I'm preaching from experience. I'm just going to tell you that. I was this height in eighth grade. Never grew. Well, I've, I've grown, but I haven't grown vertically <laughs> since eighth grade. 
And in eighth grade, I was the first one to get picked for everything. Gym, recess, whatever. Basketball, didn't matter. Pick Andrew. Why? Because all he has to do is stand under the basket, and we just throw the ball up. He's going to catch it. He's going to lay it up, and we're going to win. And uh, one, of the, one of the best athletes in our class was one of the shortest kids in the class. And so uh, me and George would go out there, and uh, uh, so I'd pick George. George would be the quarterback. And all I'd have to do is just run down the field and stand there. He'd just throw it up, and I could just out-jump him. And you could catch it, and you think you're great. Man, look at this. No. And then you go to camp, and you realize you ain't that great. <laughs> you get on the court, and you're, you're winded about halfway down. You realize you're not that good. Pride has a way of deceiving us. We think, oh, man, we can do this. We can do this. And you step out the next day and go to do it, and all of a sudden you fall flat flat on your face except the Lord build the house they labor in vain to build it let's look at the next thing he says except the Lord keep the city the keeper the watchman waketh but in vain except the Lord keep the city he's the keeper he is literally the one that that uh, uh, is responsible to uh, 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 lock, lock it up. Make sure that it's secure. He's the one that is, is the guarantor of, of the defenses of, uh, of the army there. Except the Lord keep the city. The watchman waketh but in vain. The watchman would be somebody that'd sleep on the wall in the middle of the night. Or wouldn't sleep, but sit there and he would watch and he would look and he would look for those that are coming out. He'd let people know, hey, 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 someone's coming. We better close up the city. We better, we better, we better tighten this up. Somebody's coming there. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. If the Lord, if the Lord does not hold the keys to my heart, What does it say? The watchman waketh but in vain. But pastor, I'm going to church. Let's put this in a full parallel. If the Lord is the keeper of the city, is the Lord the keeper of your heart? Is he the one that has the keys to your heart? What that means is when God says something, when God speaks something, when God commands something, does he have authority in your heart? Does he have authority to open up compartments of your life that no one else does? Does he have authority to close doors in your life that no one else does? Except the Lord keep the city. If the Lord don't keep the city, then the watchman waketh but in vain. In the Old Testament, what is the watchman? Well, the watchman is, is the prophet. It's the man of God. It's the voice of the Lord. The one that is issuing and declaring the warning. But if the Lord doesn't keep the heart, the watchman, the preacher... is speaking in vain. I can be pastor in title. I can be preacher in title and form and function, and yet church attendance still render itself in vain if the Lord does not have the keys to our heart. So God, you've got to have the keys to my heart. God, I've got to give you the keys to my heart. You, you alone ought to have authority to open and to close the compartments of my life that need to be opened and that need to be closed. You alone ought to be the one. And when God is the keeper of my heart, then all of a sudden, the watchman isn't waking in vain. But all of a sudden, everywhere I go, God's speaking to me. Everywhere I am, there's a voice of the Lord's coming, and I'm hearing it, and it edifies, and it works inside of my soul. Beware, I would say this, beware when every time you go to church and the sermon's for someone else, you may need to make a quick emergency appointment with the Lord. If every time I'm sitting through a service, I'm thinking of someone else, my heart isn't right. Because when the Lord keeps, I don't read the Bible and think, oh man, I wish brother, I got I to gotta text sister so-and-so, I got to show her this. <laughs> now, now sometimes God can prompt 
things for us. So I'm not saying that that's bad, okay? I'm not, I'm not discouraging that. But when I read Scripture, when I open up Psalm 51, and David is saying, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. I'm not thinking, oh, wow, so-and-so needs to really pray this. There ought to be something inside of your soul that's saying, yes, God, yes, God, have mercy upon me. Be the keeper of my heart. Be the keeper of my soul. Take, take authority in my life, in my spirit. God's got to have, he's got to have, he's got to have the keys to our heart. So we can't labor without the Lord in our life. And we can't, we can't expect the watchman, the warning voice, the, the sound of the Lord to have any effect or edification in our life if the Lord is not established as the keeper of the city. Of our, God, be the, keeper of my, be the keeper of my heart. Be the keeper of my home. Be the keeper of my marriage. Be the keeper of my family. God, be the keeper... Of my career. Be the keeper of my ministry. Be the keeper of my position in the kingdom of God. Lord. Be the keeper of everything in my life. Where you lead I will follow. And then the voice of the Lord can speak to us. And we can hear. Go to verse 2. It is vain for you to rise up early. To sit up late. And to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. What's he saying here? Now this is a verse that we all should just love. But in great irony, our human independence does otherwise. This is a verse that's literally saying, it's vain for you to get up so stinking early that the rest of the world's still asleep and think that you're going to just you're just going to win the world. Stop looking at your husband. Stop looking at your wife. It is vain to sit up late, right? Go to bed. Get some sleep. It is vain to eat the bread of sorrows. Live a little. Life is too short for, to eat certain foods. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. This verse warns us against overwork and anxious labor. Overwork, worry, and strain. We ought to love this, right? We ought to be saying, I'm running this verse... This verse tells me, God's got this. God's the author of our life. Your, your successes and everything really is going to be God anyways. So sleep in a little. Don't stay up so late. Don't be so anxious for everything. Don't worry about everything. What person in their right mind would not love this verse? And yet most of us in this room Myself included. And maybe as Paul said, I'm the chiefest among us. Are great offenders of this verse. Because we think, you know what? We come to church. Isn't this the irony? We come to church. Oh God, there's no one like you. No one more powerful than you. You are great. I trust you with everything. But just in case. I'm going to be up at 5 a.m. And I'm working, 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 working. I'm going to get everything done, and I'm going to stay up late, and I'm going to do all this stuff. And if I can do all this, and if I can do all that, then, then this is going to happen. And folks, no one is more convicted about this than probably the pastor. Because we take that same human thing. If I can just do this, well, if I can just, if I can just work a little bit more and give a little bit more, it's going to bless the church, and the church is going to grow, and this is going to help. And if I can just do this, and all of a sudden we start stepping up into places and making ourselves bigger and into this place, and we realize, no, 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 let's go back. 
except the Lord build the house. The success and the prosperities that you enjoy are not because of you. It's because of him. And you know where you get really frustrated is when you see somebody else that's sleeping in and going to bed early and God's blessing them just as much as you. Come on. Come on, anybody going to be honest? And you can get mad over that. Oh, how's all that stuff going? And I'm not, I'm not preaching against getting up early and I'm not preaching against staying up late and I'm not preaching against doing all those things. But what the Word of God is talking to us about is overworking because we think that we are the causers. That we are the saviors. That we are the one. God's going to do it. Is this all right tonight? Is this all right tonight? And it warns us against anxious labor. Being anxious and so worry about things. We put stresses on ourselves more than we, we ever can have. That's why, for those of you that weren't here, we had Dr. Butler come and speak to us on a Sunday night after he preached. And he talked an hour on soul care, and he talked another probably 40 minutes, half an hour on self-care. And I I implore you, if you haven't seen that, go back on our YouTube channel and catch that or on a podcast and listen to that. He's talking about practical things, and the things he's talking about are really the logistical uh, uh, practices of what this verse is talking about. Some of our problems in our life is just because we're not sleeping. And here's the problem when we're not sleeping and we're overworking is because ultimately we're not depending on the Lord. We're not trusting in the Lord. We may get tired at times in God's work, but don't ever get tired of God working. Don't ever get to the place to where we think, well, God... I can do this. If I can. No, the reality is we need, we need a sovereign move of the Lord. Stand still and see that the Lord is God. God gives us strength and God's trying to give us rest. He's trying to give us rest. And in the arrogance of our human ingenuity, we have created light bulbs. God was trying to turn off the lights. And part of the year, if you live, if you live on the northern part, a little, little northern or a little, the farther away you get from the equator, there's a season where God's going to give you more rest. And do we take advantage of that? No. We don't ever have. If you go back, there's no reason uh, 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 people look at circadian rhythms, how your body is adjusted and affected by circadian rhythms. Well, well, ancient man knew all about these practical things. Even if they didn't believe in God, they, they, they had to fall. They were subject to the sun. They were subject to the moon. They were subject to those things. They were limited by those things. But now in our human ingenuity, we have 20, well, since the pandemic, we don't have as much. But 24 hour, in the 90s, I remember 24 hour shopping came. Myers came to Indianapolis. We could shop at 2 a.m., do you know what kind of people shop at 2 a.m.? <laughs> 24 hour shopping. There was, I was, I was talking to, to some people, I think it was at IYC or something, and they were making fun of me for how old I was because I was thinking I was young. And I was thinking, isn't it crazy? Don't you guys remember a few years ago when Starbucks was 24 7? They were like, it's never been that long ago. Or never been that way. I was like, yeah, yeah, it's probably. And I was like, well, it's probably 15 years ago. <laughs> I remember in Indianapolis, we had Starbucks that was 24-7. So you could go to Starbucks and get a shot of espresso at 2 a.m. And go to Meyer and you could shop all night. <laughs> Why? Why are we doing this to ourselves? And then, and then we're worn down and we're tired and we're worn out and we're anxious for everything. And we're wondering, God, what's going wrong here? And the Lord's just like, uh, just follow the plan that I sort of put in place. Just trust in me. 
God wants to give us strength. God wants to give us rest. Now, I'll close with this, and and I'm finished. It's interesting because you go on, and I'm not talking about this, but he goes on. The interesting thing. It's an interesting line of thought that we've been taking here. Except the Lord build the house. Except the Lord keep the city. You've got to trust in the Lord. What does the next verse say? Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. So let me just leave a parting word to all you anxious parents. Children belong to the Lord. Thriving, happy children are God's doing. You can't do it alone. Helicopter parenting won't make a difference. So what is he saying? He's saying you've got to turn your children over to the Lord. Raise them in the fear and the admonition of God. Except the Lord build the house. Oh, yeah. Isn't it great? Because we can compartmentalize. Okay, God, in this area of my life, you've got to be in it. You've got to do it. And in this area, God, I want you to be the keeper of my heart. I want you to have all authority in my life. And then I see people step into parenting. But I'm going to dictate and I'm going to, I'm going to control every aspect of what's happening. No, no, no. What he's saying is you need a Sovereign move of God here. You need a sovereign move of God here. And if you're a parent, you need a you need a lot of sovereign moves of God. <laughs> and except you have a sovereign move of God, you can't teach them enough. You can't lay up for them enough inheritance. You can't give them enough. They need, they need the work of the Lord in their life as much as you need the work of the Lord in your life. And you can't make that happen, but you can create the environment by living your life in such a way that Jesus, you're the center of everything in my heart and everything in my life. Something powerful when you live your life where God has the keys to every part of your heart. Live your life by faith. If there's anything my parents gave me, it was living a life of faith and trusting in the Lord. Dad told me he didn't get serious, really serious about being a part of the church until he said, Andrew, you were born, and I was holding that baby. I'm holding you. And I looked, and all of a sudden, it's like I'm responsible for a soul. And they, they had been in church their whole life, but by the time I remember, from my earliest memories, they weren't, we didn't just attend church. We were a part of church. You were serving in the church in every capacity that you could. Singing in the choir, teaching Sunday school, whatever that was, however it was. Running different places, running, running your Sunday school class. I have memories of going to Paramount's Kings Island in Cincinnati. And taking taking a bunch of kids over there on church trips. Being with people. I remember Thanksgiving dinners that we would serve at the church to those that didn't have anywhere to go. Pizza fundraisers, making pizzas, all kinds of stuff, serving in different ways, all all around. And I I watched God control, have keys in their life to dictate their finances, to dictate choices in their life, options and career choices, ministry choices, things, doors that opened up. And some of those in human pride, there's some of those I look back now as older and say, man, human pride would have said, let me in that door. But you didn't step through doors that would have seemed like you wanted to because God had the key there and okay, I feel like God's doing something else here. God's leading something else here. God's taking something else here. And because there was a sovereign move of God in their life, it put a sovereign move of God close to my life. And I was able as a child to have sovereign moves of God. And I'm thankful. God can redeem anybody. But I'm thankful (laughs) 
that I was already frequenting the prayer room before I wanted to. I'm thankful that I, was al- I already knew where the pew was before I, before I needed it. I already, I already had a love and a respect for the preaching of the Word of God before I could understand it. Because the Lord built the house. The Lord kept the city. Otherwise, they that labor, you labor in vain. Would you stand together with me?